Well, good morning and welcome to First Methodist Church on this first Sunday after Thanksgiving. If you guys will stand up as we worship, we're going to sing, I thank God. To the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting.
morning. Good morning, church. God is good. All the time. Amen. Welcome to worship. So good to see each of you here this morning. Welcome to our guests who are with us. My name is Rick. I'm lead pastor here at First Methodist. As we gather today for worship, uh, just a, a couple of words for us. Uh, today is Christ the King Sunday. Now, some of you might not know uh, the liturgical calendar of the church, but in a lot of denominations, including Methodism, uh, there is a church calendar. And the church calendar follows kind of the, the contours of theology. And uh, so today, Christ the King Sunday is the last Sunday of the Christian year. So next Sunday is the f- first Sunday of the Christian year. And it starts with Advent. So Advent starts next Sunday. It's four weeks before Christmas. And those four weeks are a time of preparation for Christmas, a time to prepare our hearts. Typically, the color of Advent is purple or blue. After Christmas, that season of Christmas, Christmas is how many days? You're thinking one. No. There are 12 days of Christmas. Don't you know the song? Literally, in the Christian calendar, there are... 12 days of Christmas. It's a season. The Christmas season is 12 days. And then you get into, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus' baptism. So the the calendar kind of follows the contours of Jesus. Starts with the birth, Advent, goes through what we call kingdom time, which is the majority of the year. Uh, Pentecost is red. Kingdom tide is green. And then we get uh, before Easter, the season of Lent. It goes back to purple. And then we have Easter, which is white the Easter season, and then after that, and then Christ the King Sunday is kind of the the New Year's Eve of the Christian year. So on this Sunday, we are reminded that Christ is King, that he should be King of our hearts, that he should be King of our entire life. And so that's what we come this morning as we worship and all that we do we are reminded that Christ is indeed king of our hearts. And so uh, as we uh, worship this morning, let's remember that. In fact, let's go to God in a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day that we are reminded again that you are king, king of the universe, and I pray that you are king of our hearts. On this Sunday as we give our lives all to you, help us. Help us to give it to you, Lord. Help us to have the desire to give it to you. Sometimes it needs to just start with that. We don't even have the desire, so we can pray for anything. So we even pray right now, Lord, that you would give us desire to give everything to you, that you would give us that desire to love you more and more. We just thank you. We thank you for your presence here with us. Open our hearts as we worship, Lord, that we worship you in spirit and truth. We pray all this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. As you've walked in, hopefully you got a connect card, and I would invite you to fill that out. We do want to know of your presence in worship today. You can drop in the offering bags as they go by later. Also, if you have a prayer request, you can text me your prayer request. Uh, The number should be on the screen there. Or you can fill out one of the prayer request cards in the back of the pews. There, the chairs, and uh, I'll come by and, and grab that here in a minute. But let's stand as we continue to sing and worship this morning. Christ our King.
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you read your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth, you paid it. You have been so, so good to me.
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me.
can't get enough. I just want you. Thank you all so much. What a, a great time of worship we've had so far this morning. Well, many of you know our prayer cross over here. Uh, some of you might not know, but uh, we have a basket of ribbons. And then we invite you to take a ribbon out of the basket. If you have a prayer request, something that you're praying for specific. And the ribbon is just a reminder to pray. And then we invite you once you have... a once God has answered that prayer, to bring the ribbon back and place it on the cross as a visual reminder for all of us that God answers prayer. And, uh, and so you can see we have a lot of ribbons on our cross of answered prayers for many of you. But since it's Christ the King Sunday and the end of the year, we're going to strip the cross uh, of the prayer requests and put them back in the basket. But I, but I want us to just take a moment and and think about all these answered prayers. Some of them are some of your prayers. And how God is faithful uh, and he hears us. Um, so often though we, we are uh, tone deaf to hear his voice. And so we really need to cultivate a life of thanksgiving and, and gratitude. Of all that God has done and is doing. Because God is moving in big ways but oftentimes in small ways. And we, we need to be in tune to the move of the spirit. So... I just thank God for all of these answered prayers that we have. Uh, and there's more. Not every one of you took a prayer ribbon, uh, but many of you did. But we thank God for these. And as we take a prayer request, anyone have a prayer request? If you'll hold up your card, I'll come and grab it. Anyone have one? I think uh, several of you texted me. Anyone need a ribbon for something you're praying for? grab one. Prayer requests, prayers for healing and new opportunities. Amen to that. Um, Who we'll lift up this prayer request this morning? Thank you. And then prayers for my sister Catherine as she seeks direction in her life and embraces where God is leading her. Who we'll lift up Catherine this morning? Thank you all. Anyone else need a ribbon? And then a joy. We'll get there. Uh, a joy. A good friend has been estranged from his son for 12 years. His son came back to him to revive the relationship over Thanksgiving. So that's a joy. Amen to that. Who will pray for this uh, relationship? that it will continue to grow. Who will lift that up in prayers? Thank you. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Indeed, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for uh, the ways you answer prayer. For all these ribbons that have been on the cross to remind us of answered prayers, we give you thanks. I am thankful and excited about the ribbons that are in the basket that will be taken out at some point over this year. Prayers of desperation, prayers of grief, prayers of opportunity, prayers that are filled with hope. And I'm just excited for the ways that you're going to answer. for The ways that you're going to move uh, and we can hardly imagine. So Lord, I, 
I lift up these yet-to-be-asked prayers to you in thankfulness that you are a God who hears our prayer. I lift up this day, Lord Christ the King Sunday, as we are reminded that all of our life should be given over to you. Lord, sometimes we struggle with that because we don't even have that desire in us. We want to have the desire, but we don't even have it. So God, we even go back and ask, God, give us desire to want you more than anything else. Give us the desire to give all to you in all of our life. Lord, we pray this morning for healed relationships and pray you would continue to heal. We pray for those who are seeking direction in life. And we pray, God, that you would give us contentment in wherever we find ourselves. We pray for new opportunities, Lord. We pray for all of these things and we give you thanks. Lord, uh, in this moment, we turn uh, and look to the person on our left. Whether we know them or not, Lord, we ask that you would bless them and we lift them up to you in prayer. And for the person on our right, Lord, we do the same. We thank you. We thank you that you have called us your child, that we were created in your image. And we thank you for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. And so as we gather as a body of Christ in the name of Jesus, we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to invite our children to come forward for our children's time. Good morning. There we go. How's everyone? Good? All right. How was your Thanksgiving? Good? Did you eat lots of turkey? A little bit of ham? Tell everybody what you ate. Meatloaf. (laughs) Meatloaf. She told me that in Sunday school. I said, do you like everybody's meatloaf? She said, only her dad's. There you go. So that's sweet. I thought that was cool. She had meatloaf. I don't guess she's a fan of turkey. No? Anyway, I thought it was precious. Okay, so today I'm going to ask you all a question, and you've got to use your imagination. You've got a good imagination, all of you. Long time ago, way back a long time ago, when there were knights. You know what I'm talking about, like knight in shining armor? Close enough. Yeah, way back then, even further back than that. Can you imagine a knight back in those days going into battle with no armor on at all. They had no armor on. I think he would die. Me too. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think he would come out alive? Oh, my goodness. Do you know that back then the armor they wore was total metal, all metal, and it would cover every inch of their body from the top of their head all the way down to their toes? Wow. Wow. If something like that was coming at you, would it scare you? Yes, me too. I'd run away. We're going to talk about a different armor today. Do I have any? No, none of my kiddos are in here. Oh, yes, Adeline, you're here. We're going to talk about a different armor. Do you remember what we talked about during class? Armor of? Sword of the Spirit. That's part of it. We're going to talk about the armor of God. So in Ephesians 6, 11 through 18, it says, In verse 11, it says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, right? And if this is what the Bible tells us. If you don't have the armor of God on, the devil is going to win, right? He's going to win. 
And I'm going to tell you what, yes, he will. So, and this is why. In verse 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in the dark world, against the evil spirits of the heavenly places. Therefore, this is chapter 13, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after battle, you will stand, be standing firm. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the different pieces of armor. The first one is the um, belt of righteousness. Belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. There you go. She was close. And for shoes, we put on what? Um, the shoes of the gospel. Peace. Good deal. And then after that, we hold the shield of faith. And it stops all the fiery arrows that the devil might throw at us. We put on our helmet of mission. And what is the other thing that we do? The most important, I think. Sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Yes, the Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All my fourth and fifth graders have been learning about this, so it's kind of a test for them. So I want you to take a look at this guy right here. This one right here. Pretend. I named him George. George the Orange. Okay. Well, let me tell you. In the beginning, George was on fire for the Lord. He had his armor on. He was ready to go to battle every single day. But you see, he started listening to people that told him there was no God. His friends started making fun of him because he went to church. And they also made fun of him because he read his Bible at school. So little by little, the fire went out. And he started drifting away from God. He started hanging out with the wrong people, saying the wrong things, acting out at school, talking back to his parents. That's a no-no. So do you think if George here went into battle without any armor on, do you think he would survive? Do you think he would sink or swim? Sink? Well, let's see. Hold this up to me, please. So, he started losing his belt of truth, and then the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace. Shoes of peace. What's the next one? You remember? The helmet of salvation. And what's the last one? And the sword of the word of the spirit. Which is the word? Which is the word of God. Okay. So now George had no armor on at all, right? So when he goes in the battle, do you think he's going to have a victory? No. no. I think he might sink. To the bottom and be sad. Let's see. Hold this. We're coming up to our battle, and there George goes. He sank to the bottom. No way for him to have any type of victory, right? See, he had no protection, no armor on, so he went right straight to the bottom. But let me tell you something. This guy right here, this one, he represents every single one of us, okay? And he's been reading the Bible and going to church, hanging out with the right people, praying, worshiping God. Just he is on fire for the Lord. He's been doing all the things. He has his armor on daily. So when we all put our armor on and we are full of the Holy Spirit and living right, there is nothing the devil can to do to us anymore, right? He cannot keep us down. Let's see. He's got the armor on. Let's see if he stays afloat. <gasps> he floats, right? So that's what happens when you have your armor of God on. You stay afloat. Nothing can bring you down. So I want to ask each and every one of you to put your armor on every day and to pray and read your Bible, hang out with the right people, and do all the right things so that you are covered 
in the armor, and you are protected. Can you do that? Yes, we can. Okay, church, let's pray. Will you pray with us? Dear Lord, we are in a spiritual battle, but we are your warriors. We thank you for giving us armor to fight with. And we ask that you remind us to put it on every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, y'all go have an amazing Sunday. great visual for us today as we uh, prepare to read God's word this morning our text you can see it on the screen there 1 Timothy 6 11 through 19 if you have your Bible I encourage you to grab it the Apostle Paul wrote Timothy uh, this letter and uh, this is verse 11 through 19 hear this word But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Verse 17. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. You know, we're talking about all to Jesus, how we are to give all to Jesus. That's the calling that we have as as disciples of Jesus, that everything we have, really, we we give to Jesus because he owns it. And there are certain things in our life that we struggle with giving over to Jesus. And even as I said in the prayer, sometimes we don't even have the desire to want to give it over. And so sometimes we have to pray for desire to give things over to Jesus. But there are some things that we hold on to because we're unsure of. We don't have as much faith and we struggle. And one of those big ones that I think Christians struggle with is money. Giving our finances, our money, our savings, everything we have over to God. And I think part of that struggle is that, you know, we don't truly believe that Jesus knows best when it comes to our money. We think that we know better or that the world might have a better answer than Jesus or that the Bible really doesn't speak to money. But as I said before, the Bible, especially Jesus, speaks more about money than any other subject except the kingdom of God. And often, and most of the time, when Jesus is speaking about money, he is speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, the world's answers about money might help you gain a lot of money, but oftentimes at the expense of our souls or save a lot of money. But then we tend to rely on our savings instead of relying on faith on God. So in this three-week series that we've been in, we've used uh, John Wesley's sermon, The Use of Money, as our our backdrop. And we talked about that that statement, that maxim that uh, Wesley said, gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. We started two weeks ago with gaining all you can, that that is, is an important part of this message of money. And then last week we talked about saving all you can. And then this week we're talking about giving all you can. And if you haven't been here, I've said each Sunday, each Sunday's sermon is incomplete. You really have to listen to all three to get a full picture of a biblical perspective 
on money. And so if you haven't listened to the others, I would encourage you to go back, go to our website, you can listen, or Facebook, and, and listen to this sermon, uh, or these three sermons. But this is the last of this series. And, and I think oftentimes that uh, people get cynical when, when pastors start talking about money. Uh, I understand that. Sometimes I get cynical when pastors start talking about money as well. Uh, and I think part of it is because in some of us, deep down, we, we think, you know, the church, all they want is my money. And we hear that out in the world, but that's, that's really not the truth. What we as pastors want is we want you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we want you to have really the joy of what it means to give all to Jesus. We struggle with that, pastors. We know you struggle with that as well, but we want to encourage you to grow deep in that connection to Jesus and to each other. And we know that money can often be a barrier for us going deeper with Jesus. And so I've said it before, if you struggle with giving money to your church because you don't trust your church, you're in the wrong church. I would encourage you to find another church if you don't trust us because something is wrong there. But in, in the Bible, when it talks about giving, especially when Jesus talks about giving, and even in the Old Testament when it talks about giving, it talks about two places that you should give. And one is, you know, to the church, to the leaders of the church, and the other is to the poor. So if you struggle with how your church uses your, the money, then give your money to the poor. You'll really struggle then with how the poor use your money. But that's really where we're called to give. And, and we don't want to guilt you, although sometimes a little guilt can help. A lot of guilt isn't really helpful, but a little guilt can start get us motivated until our hearts get right. But really, we don't want it to be strictly about guilt. That's not the reason we give. We give because we want to give all to Jesus because we know how much he has done for us. Because he gave his all for us. And it is out of that love and gratitude. So just kind of a background as we start this morning. But I want to turn back to Wesley and his advice to us on this topic of money. He says this, Do not imagine that you have done anything merely by gaining and saving all you can. Do not stop there. Making and saving money is nothing if we fail to go forward to the final purpose. People cannot rightly be said to, have to save money if they only store it away, you might just as well throw your money into the sea as bury it in the ground or as store it in your, in your money chest or in the Bank of England. Not to use your money is essentially to throw it away. Isn't that an interesting statement? Not to use your money is to essentially throw it away. First, having gained all you can. Second, having saved all you can. Then give all you can. That's how he starts when he talk, starts talking about this subject. And when he starts talking about this third piece, giving all you can, I'm fascinated by the advice that Wesley gives, and it is biblical advice, but it might not be what you would expect. But I really love how Wesley puts it. He says this, If you want to be a faithful and wise steward of the things that God has presently put into your hands, do the following things. And here's his first piece of advice. Provide first for your basic needs. This is the first piece of giving is to first provide for yourself, to provide for your basic needs. Here's the problem, though. In America, we really don't understand what needs are. We know what wants are, but most of our needs, there are some that struggle with the needs, but, I, but for the majority of us, we don't struggle with needs. We struggle with desires, the things above our needs. In the church, in other parts of the country, People struggle with needs, and that's why miracles happen more often in those countries, as an aside, because they pray in faith that God will provide for their needs, and he does. But we have to understand needs. We talked last week about needs are not extravagant food, designer clothes, expensive home decor, so on and so forth. But the simple basic things, you know, food, clothing, shelter, the, that, that's what we should provide for first when we talk about giving, we need to be able to provide those things. It's going to be a little different for each of us. A family of six children are going to have a lot more needs, right? All you're going to be buying is groceries, 
right? If you're single, needs are going to be different. So I can't tell you exactly what a need is, but we kind of know what it is. Intuitively, we can understand what that is. And Wesley, he practiced what he preached. When he began in ministry, he, he learned that he could live on 30 pounds a year. Now, this is England, so pound is like a dollar. Uh, and, and that amount was a small amount. And so as he made more money, he kept living on 30 pounds. Now, here's the fascinating thing about Wesley is that Wesley became incredibly wealthy. In one year, he made the equivalent of about $400,000. And he continued to live on 30 pounds and he gave the rest away. He lived on 2% of his income and he gave away 98% of his income because his needs were very low in just the England and the time and what he lived on. In fact, over his lifetime, he made millions of dollars. But when he died, all he had to his name were a few coins, some silver, a couple of silver spoons, and he'd given everything else to the church and to the poor. He practiced what he preached. He learned what he needed and gave away the rest. He gained all he could. He made millions. He saved all he could. He didn't waste it. And then he gave all he could. His generosity, though, was built on the basis that all that he had was a gift from God and that he was called to steward it well. He gained all he could, saved all he could in order to give all he could. So his first, provide for your basic needs. That was his first thing. Provide for your needs. That's important. We need to be able to live. And then second, he said this, provide for your family. Makes sense, right? In fact, Scripture tells us we should do the same. In 1 Timothy, again in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, Whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially for family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So here's Wesley's advice on giving. The first two things are about providing for yourself and providing for your family. Those are the first two things we should do when we give. And in fact, Wesley gave us advice too on to know if what we're spending on ourselves and on our family is good. And these were four questions that Wesley would ask and it would invite us to ask too when it comes to providing for ourselves and for our family. He says this, in spending this money, am I acting according not as an owner, but as a steward of God's goods? Am I giving this money in obedience to God's word? In what scripture does God require me to spend this money? It's a good question. Third, can I offer up this action or expenditure as a sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ? And fourth, do I have a reason to believe that for this very work I will receive a reward at the resurrection of the righteous? I love that question. In me spending money on this clothing, this furniture, this whatever, this food, I believe that for this very thing, I will receive a reward because he is acting as a steward of the gifts that God has given him. So those are the questions that he would ask of any time he is providing for himself or providing for his family. It's quite a lot to think about. And then, in fact, Wesley offers prayers for us to say so that we can help even further. Here's the prayer that Wesley would say. Lord, you see that I am ready to expend this amount on this food, clothing, or furniture. You know that I do this with a single eye as a steward of your property. I want to spend this money for the purpose you planned when you gave me these resources. You know that I do this in obedience to your word as you command it and because you command it. I pray that you allow this expenditure to become a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And give me inner witness that for this labor of love I will have a reward when you will repay everyone for what has been done. Wow, what a prayer. Now, you don't have to say the same prayer, but, but what I love about Wesley is in everything that he had, he is raising the bar, raising the bar up here and here. This idea that everything I have is God's. And so he wants me to make a lot of money so that I can bless others. We talked about that and gain what we can. He, he doesn't want us to waste our money. And then he wants us to give. And so in this Ways to give. First, we provide for ourselves. Second, we provide for our families. Then third, we are to provide for others. First, to the family of faith, the church, and then for the good of all. 
That's his order in giving. Provide for your basic needs, provide for your family, provide for others, first to the family of the church, and then for the good of all. These are really Wesley's simple rules for giving all you can. In fact, he sums it up by saying this, in your living and dying, waste nothing on sin or on foolishness for yourself or for your children. And finally, give all you can. In other words, give to God everything you have. That's Wesley's advice on giving all you can. So I go from Wesley to Scripture to see what God has to say for us. And and I want to turn first to the book of Malachi. If you don't know Malachi, it's the the last book in the Old Testament. It's a prophetic book. Uh, And in the book of Malachi, it starts with God telling his people, you and me, how much he loves them how much he cares for him, how much he wants the best for us, how we are dearly loved. But then he goes on to warn us that the church, basically, the people of God, that they have been corrupted. And he reminds them of the consequences of disobedience. The priests and the pastors, they become corrupt. The people have become hard-hearted and cynical. You know, it's, it's easy for us to get hard-hearted and cynical in this world because the world is pushing things at us. And, and the people of God had become hard-hearted and cynical. And he is, God is calling his people to return back to him. He is saying, hey, come back. And part of Malachi's message is warning about how the community of faith has given to God. And so we read this early on, Malachi 1, 13 and 14. God, this is God speaking. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as a sacrifice, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So basically... The people of God, they have been commanded to give offerings at the temple to sacrifice. And God had called them in his word to give the first and the best. And the people were bringing not the first, the leftovers, the pocket change, the lame animals. God won't mind. And God is condemning them for their practices, for not giving them the best and the first. Instead of bringing the best... You have offered pocket change to me. And then later in Malachi, God again condemns us. This is Malachi 3, 8 through 12. He says, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. And pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and your vines and your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is God speaking to a whole nation, not speaking to an individual, but speaking to a whole nation. And he's basically telling us, church, If you will obey me, if you will be faithful, I will bless you. Now, I've talked about this is not prosperity gospel. A prosperity gospel says if I give to God, then he will bless me financially and everything will be fine. That is not the way it works. What God is saying is if you are faithful to me and you give to me, you will have enough and you will be content. That is the miracle, is that you're content. Not that you have an abundance. And so this is that part of that that testimony that God is saying, I will bless you, I will provide for you, you will have enough. But because we have a lack of faith, we want to hedge our bets and we want to do things that we're not supposed to do. Now, have you ever gotten a tongue lashing from your, your, your folks before? Any of you? Just me? Okay. Basically, this is a tongue lashing from God to the people of God. As God is telling them, hey, I'm trying to bless you. 
but you will not obey me. And if you don't obey me, there are consequences. And you're not going to like the consequences. The consequences is that you will be out of covenant with me. But I want you to be in covenant with me. I love you. I want the best for you. But if you disobey, I'm sorry. He's upset because his children are taking advantage of the blessings that he is pouring out on them and not thanking him. He's upset because he wants to pour out blessings and they won't listen. And again, this is not about giving to charity or or giving to other things. This is about giving our life to the kingdom. This is kingdom principles. And, And this is important. It's about giving to God. When I tell you that I invite you to give to God through the church, that's the mentality that we have to have, is that when we give to the church, we are really giving to God through the church. When you give to the poor, you're really giving to God through the poor. And it's all about the kingdom primarily. So, for example, you know or you should know, I went to Texas Tech. I love Texas Tech. It is a fantastic school. I met my wife at Texas Tech. Do you know what sits in my office? I brought it down just for y'all. Raider Red, he plays the fight song. I would play it, but it'd take too long. and You can't stop it once he starts. But I, but I love Tech because it is such a great school. Did y'all see the, the band at Macy's Parade? Wasn't that fantastic? amazing. Hopefully you didn't watch the game Friday. There he is, red or red. I love tech. Tech will never get any money from me, except when I go to a ball game or buy a t-shirt. Not because I'm mad at him. I love tech. It's a great institution. Business school calls me all the time. Hey, will you donate money? No, I won't. You know why? Because I'm about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God trumps Texas Tech. The kingdom of God is, is primary. So we have given and we have to Asbury Seminary where we also went to school. We give to Asbury because they're training up men and women for the kingdom of God. This is primary. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about things that will last in eternity. I'm not mad at universities. They do an incredible job of getting money out of alumni. Good for them. They are shrewd. Go back to the first sermon about gaining all you can, how this world is really shrewd about doing the things that secure their future. And we as a church, this is where we have, we have messed up. We have not done a good job of helping you see the importance of the kingdom of God. People live, uh, leave millions of dollars in their estates for institutions that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God and give pocket change to the church that nurtured their faith and helped them for eternity. It's a shame. Now I'm going to take some of the blame and I'm going to try to do a better job of this in the future. Because maybe you don't understand the importance of the kingdom of God. That it trumps everything. It is the most important so let me just say, you know, I haven't been giving you a vision. I, the church is in the middle of putting together a master plan for the facility and how we can best impact 10% of the communities we serve. That's our, our vision, right? A discipleship movement that is impacting the community. Everything we do facility-wise, youth, uh, children, adults, it is about impacting the world for the kingdom of God, a discipleship movement. And so that's one of the things I want to do. Mike and I have talked about, I want to do a pastor academy training up students. So if you want to give to that, I'll take your money. The Wesley needs a new building. I will take a check this morning for $5 million. Make it out to the church. I'll give it directly to the Wesley for them to build a new building to hold all their students. If you want something to give to, let's give to the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. That's why we give. What are we investing our money into? Things that advance the kingdom or things that will not last beyond this life? Here's the thing. You all know this. We're all called to be generous. You know that. 
you all know that we should be giving more, but sometimes we need a reminder. Sometimes we need to be encouraged to see beyond ourselves. So the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to his friend Timothy, the one he's mentored, he gives him some adv important advice. And that was the scripture we read earlier. And I just want to read it again. If you have your Bible, you might, you might grab it and look at it. It'll be on the screen too. So again, this is 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. This is the end of, of the letter. And this is, it's, it's like he's trying to cram everything in here so that Timothy can understand and really be encouraged. He says this, but you, man of God, and you, woman of God, this is for all of us, flee from all of this, the world, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's that whole thing. Things that are eternal. Take hold of the life that's really life. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Paul didn't stop there. You would think that would be a good ending spot. He said amen. But like a good pastor, doesn't know when to stop, keeps going, right? I didn't get an amen on that. Thank you, Mikey. Yeah. So then he adds to it. And this is what he adds. This is the word that he adds. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He gives to us so we can enjoy this life. Yeah, he gives for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves. That's, again, going back to the Sermon 1, thinking about the kingdom, as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I love that last little part there and how the NIV translate that. Take hold of the life that's really life. See, that's what he's saying. He's not trying to make us guilty. He's trying to explain to us, if you do these things, you will take hold of life and you will have life. And it will be enjoyable. It will be good. He is giving Timothy sound financial advice because he wants Timothy to take hold of life that is really life. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. That's what he wants for us as a body of Christ, the church. God wants you to take hold of the life that is really life, to enjoy this life by remembering that it is God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We give all we can so that we can have life. I want you to know the joy of giving back to God about the kingdom, the blessings of knowing you are investing in something that is eternal. Because... As the great hymn reminds us, we are called to give all to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I surrender all. That's really the prayer. And so today here in just a second, in fact, I'm going to invite the band if y'all come up. I'm going to invite you to take a moment, and hopefully you got one of these cards as you came in. If you're a member or you call First Methodist home, this is for you. If you're a guest here this morning, just sit back and have fun. Uh, this isn't for you. But if you're a guest here this morning and you're a member of another church, then I would encourage you in this moment to really prayerfully consider what is God calling you to give to his kingdom through your church, wherever you are at. But if you have a card, uh, if you would take it out, uh, and, and if you haven't filled it out already, I want to just go through a couple of things because here's what we're going to do. We're going to fill these out 
if you would are so inclined. And then here in a moment, we're going to lay them on the altar as an act of worship, as an act of committing to God, to giving back to Him. We use these cards in helping us as we discern what God is calling us as a church to do in the next year as well. At the top of the card, there's a place for you to put your name and address and phone and email. If one of those is a change, if you'll let us know. And if you'll do us a favor, if you would really print so that we can read your name, so we know who you are, that'd be awesome. In the middle box there, it's how you can give. Maybe you're going to give weekly or semi-monthly or monthly or just a a whole total. You can put that there. And then in that bottom shaded area, there's places for you to check if you are tithing, which is giving at least 10% of your income. Uh, If you're not tithing, but you're stepping up, you're giving more than you have in the past. If you would mark that, and if you have never filled out a card before, if you'd mark that as well. We do this to help track the spiritual health of our church. Not to pat yourself on the back, but to really help us to discern, are we moving closer as disciples? Are we getting closer to what we are called to be, especially through money? Because we know that money is one of those last things for us to really give all to Jesus. That's part of it. So we're gonna, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll sing. And, uh, and as we're singing, you're just invited uh, to come up and lay these on the altar. But here's what else I would in- invite you to do. As you come, uh, you can kneel as well, pray over the gift that you give, but also just pray for all the gifts and, and pray for the church that there really is a breakthrough that happens in our lives and the spiritual health that we are able to fulfill that vision of impacting 10% of the communities that we serve. For Jesus, that we truly are a discipleship movement. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gifts that you have called us to give, to give all to you. Lord, we pray that you would bless this moment, this time that we have before you, that you would move in mighty ways, that you would really convict us of the calling that you have given us to give all to you. Lord, bless this time that we have together, we pray, as a church and as a body of Christ. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's stand as we sing and as we come forward, just at your, when you feel called to come forward. Also, I'm going to leave this basket up here. If, if you have a prayer request, just come and grab one of these that, to remind you to pray over the next coming weeks. And when God answers that prayer that you have, you can come and lay it on the cross. The altar is open. In the dark, just we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father and praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory and majesty, praise forever to the King. Reveal the kingdom's coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for an even in their suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died.
its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb and conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these gifts that we lay at your altar, for what you will do through them. We know that whatever we give, you can multiply. We know that our feeble offerings, you can do amazing things. Lord, help us again to have the desire to give all to you. In all things, we give you praise. And again, for these gifts, we pray your blessings. Use them in this next year to do amazing things for breakthrough for your kingdom, we pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. You may be seated. I want to invite our ushers to come and we'll take our morning offering. As they pass the offering bags around, you can also uh, drop your Connect card in the offering bag as they go around. Y'all can go ahead and just start passing those down the aisles for me. A couple of announcements for us before we finish this morning. First tonight, 6 o'clock, hanging of the greens. It's just a fancy word for uh, we're decorating the church tonight for Advent and Christmas. So I invite you to come back tonight at 6. We're going to have dinner. We're going to meet at 6 down in the sanctuary. We're going to have just a moment of uh, prayer. We're going to sing and short devotional as we uh, prepare for the evening. Then we'll decorate and eat uh, and just invite you to come. It's always a fun time. Uh, I, I love that evening. And so invite you tonight, six o'clock. Uh, angel tree gifts. If you're doing angel trees, thank you to all those who uh, are so faithful in providing for others and in giving to the poor, those who are in need. Those gifts are due next Sunday. So invite you to do that. And then also uh, Wednesday night, we're having a, a parent's day out, six to eight here in the, the church. So parents, drop your kids off and then go take a nap or uh, go shopping, or go on a date, any of those things, but that's this Wednesday night. If you need any more information, all that is on our website. You can uh, connect with that as well. Um, To those who are guests, we're so glad you're here this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we have a gift for you back at our welcome desk. Please go by and and grab that. Also, if you're new and you want to learn more about who we are, I uh, lead a, a First Steps gathering every Sunday morning at 940 during our Sunday school hour. It's in our church library, which is kind of all the way down the hall on the left. Love for you to join us any Sunday morning. We can get connected and you can learn more about who we are and we can get to know you as well. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we uh, have our benediction, our breakthrough prayer. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, first Sunday of Advent. We're going to be talking about where is God uh, making a breakthrough in your life. During the season of Advent, we're going to be going through the Christmas story according to the four Gospels. So next Sunday, we're going to be looking at Uh, the Christmas story in the eyes of Matthew, and then Mark, Luke, and then John. So that's next Sunday. But uh, if you'll put the the prayer on the screen there, let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are praying for breakthrough. Give us truth, wisdom, and boldness as we intentionally seek your will in all things. 
transform, restore, and renew our church and community. With your grace and holiness, guide us to be obedient as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Thank you, Lord Most High, for how you will move in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all go in peace.